Hi, welcome to the A Quilting Life podcast. I'm Sherry McConnell from A Quilting Life. And I'm Chelsea Stratton from Chelsea Stratton Designs. Today's episode is airing on Monday, October 25th, 2021, and it's a really unique presentation that we're excited to share with you. Yes, very unique. It's awesome. Um, We've actually never done anything quite like this before, but during the summer, uh, one of the curators from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts reached out to us and wondered if we might be interested in learning a little bit more about an exhibit beginning this actually began this month and which runs until January and if we we might be interested in talking with the curator Jennifer Swope about the exhibit and I'm going to let Billy read the title of the exhibit so I don't mess anything up and he <laughs> he can also give the exact Uh, run dates for this show. Yeah, so the name of the exhibit is Fabric of a Nation, American Quilt Stories. And uh, like my mom said, it's at the Boston uh, Museum of Fine Arts, and it's it's, um, currently up and running right now. It started on October 10th, and it will be up all the way through January 17th, 2022. So that's the name of it. And if any of you are in the Boston area or Northeast area that... uh, sounds like something that would be very interesting to go to go visit if you're both into quilting or just into history uh, as I found out when when I was um, listening on to the to the interview yeah that was it was really interesting because uh, B- Billy actually his bachelor's degree is in history and I feel like he really enjoyed the interview the conversation was fascinating for me. I feel like with everything being shut down for so long, I've really missed seeing the exhibits at the fall quilt market. Yeah, for sure. uh, In Houston, the quilt festival exhibits, we can always look at those during quilt market. Yeah. And so in that venue, you get some of the quality of quilts that is going to be found in this exhibit in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And so I found that as I was talking with Jennifer, it just kind of made me miss that. And I really just wanted to jump on a plane and go to Boston and see this exhibit. <laughs> there is a book also that she tells talks about. During, and so we'll put a link to that. So if you're not able to go, there is a book that you're able to purchase and also, as we talk, Billy will pop up images of the different quilts that that she's sharing and with us. And they're incredible. Yes. They're just incredible. Yeah, yeah they're, they're definitely, again, coming from not knowing anything about um, these different styles and everything. They, they, they look a lot different than you, your quilts. They're more, they look a lot like, like some of them look like they're painted. You yeah, know what I mean? And sure. I know it's like just different styles and techniques and everything, but it was sort of, it was interesting to learn about that and then look at all the historical ties that are with all of these different quilts, you know, yeah. and some of them are similar. I'm, uh, you know, I'm looking at some right now on my computer, but some are, uh, I guess I'm learning the log cabin <laughs> blocks. I see some of those and a right. few of these, but um, some of them are just very unique and something I've never seen before. Okay, so just real quick, I'm going to share the quilts and the quilt on the wall. Actually, I'm going to, you know, spring a little Christmas on you (laughs) a little bit sooner than usual. But this is uh, under the tree and it uses fat quarters. I originally made this in our walkabout collection, which is out of print, but uh, super fun fabrics and just a really sweet Christmas quilt. So that is available in PDF and paper pattern form. And just cute presents, guys. Who doesn't love presents? Uh, The quilt on the table is Plaza. You have seen this one before. Uh, And it uses fat quarters and fat eighths and is just a multi-level house quilt. So there's the quilts for you. They're both available in PDF and paper pattern form. So I always have loved this one. I love house quilts. Yeah, I almost want to redo it in like, Halloween spooky houses oh, that'd like be fun. yeah so I kind of that's why I pulled it out today because I'm like yeah. maybe I should go recolor this and share it on social media and just give a new vibe for it yeah so. you could do Christmas houses I could do Christmas houses you could do scrappy with a bunch of our collections possibilities are cute. endless yeah <laughs> 
Okay, so now we will jump to the interview with Jennifer Swope, and we hope you will enjoy this conversation as much as we did. Okay, hello, and here I am with Jennifer Swope. She is from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and we are very excited to let her tell us about an upcoming exhibit. Actually, when this airs, it will already be in place, The Fabric of a Nation, 50-plus Historic and Contemporary Quilts. I believe the dates I have are October 10th through January 17th. And we are super excited to hear all about this from you, Jennifer. <laughs> well, thank you, Sherry, for um, having me on your podcast. I'm really excited to share this uh, amazing exhibition uh, with with everyone who's interested in quilts. And hopefully we'll um, engage some people who don't think that they're interested in quilts yet. Um, the uh, Fabric of a Nation, American Quilt Stories, as you said, will open at the Museum of Fine Arts. It will have already opened by the time this starts on uh, October 10th, 2021. And I, as far as I understand, the run is until January 16th, 2022. Okay. Um, the, uh, we just, it just was rolled back by one day. Um, and as you said, there are 50 quilts and other works of art that Span 300 years, and with them, we hope to bring visitors into uh, an experience where they can explore the American quilt and its evolution in parallel with uh, with the story of America itself, and um, how quilts have been a witness to this history. What are the stories they tell, and um, and how artists and quilt makers and the communities of people who have uh, who've been engaged with quilts and are interested in quilts, how, how this resonates with our, our collective story as a nation. Um, we were, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to, it just sounds so exciting to me. I would love to see it in person. I <laughs> Yes, well, we're hoping many people will be able to come to Boston and see it in person. Um, but if that's not possible, we're so fortunate to have uh, been able to uh, publish a book of highlights of the American Quilt and Bed Cover Collection, which the same title, American um, Fabric of a Nation, American Quilt Stories, which we were talking about. And I, I think that will be a, um, for those who haven't had the chance to look at the book, um, the publication. I think that will bring people into the quilts themselves because they are beautifully photographed and, and illustrated and some of the stories behind them. Oh, that's wonderful. That's, that's, that's good to know that there's going to be a publication like that. So there is a publication and you can order it, which oh. is very exciting. So, um, uh, yeah, so the, the publication is a little different than the exhibition in the sense that there are 58 uh, quilts and bed covers and, uh, and works of art in it. And, um, and the, uh, the exhibition has, uh, has some other pieces that we weren't able to illustrate uh, in the publication just because of when we got them. But uh, but they're both 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 the, the exhibit is worth visiting and the publication is uh, is is worth it's worth getting for your for your quilt library. Oh, wonderful! And I'm sure that you'll be able to give us a link for that that we can put up for the listeners and where they can purchase yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So awesome. It's all on the same page on the uh, museum's website. Okay. Um, and then that's also where it's uh, where the, the museum's website will have. Um, if a person wants to go and see the exhibition, then they can get tickets, uh, time tickets for the exhibition uh, through the museum's website. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> you are the one who curated the exhibit, I'm right? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. oh, I just want to hear how you made the decisions <laughs> and how... It's, uh, yeah, we started, so um, that I think you're right about the decisions are sort of the, the central question. Um, when we, uh, and I say we, I worked on, I was very fortunate to be able to work with Pam Parmel and Lauren Whitley, 
uh, curators uh, in, of, of textile and fashion arts here at the Museum of Fine Arts who have since taken early retirement. But we started working on the book together um, over three years ago. And we wanted to write a book that uh, that would uh, provide um, an overview or highlights of the American quilt and bed cover collection at the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, we have over 300 examples. They're beautiful, and and uh, and it, we, it was well overdue. And we had um, really made um, some important acquisitions. Uh, to add to that strength over the last two decades. And so from that publication, which includes 58 examples um, from the collection, um, we've started to realize like, hey, this could be a great exhibit. And um, so we started to also plan an exhibition. And one thing that we wanted to do in planning the exhibition is we wanted to sort of uh, break out or slightly, you know, alter a purely chronological presentation, march through time. Uh, so the exhibition will uh, start off with um, essentially like a question, and it will will show among uh, I, I will show objects that are uh, some of the strengths of our collection, um, but across time. So we'll have, for example a beautiful quilt by Irene Williams of Jeeves Bend, Alabama that she made in 1975, which we call the vote quilt because she used this red, white, and blue vote pattern to make um, a, uh, a, a log cabin pattern quilt, essentially. And um, and then we'll also have uh, our incredible Bisa Butler uh, piece, which we acquired recently, specifically for the publication and for the exhibition which is titled To God in Truth. And uh, Bisa Butler made this piece um, from based on a, uh, a black and white photograph taken around 1899 or 1900 that shows uh, a number of players on the Morris Brown baseball team. And Morris Brown is a traditionally a black college in uh, Atlanta. And um, it had just been founded about 10 years before the photograph was taken. And in it, she recreates these figures who are shown, you know, in repose. They look like, they look like, you know, it's a very typical picture of, in a sense, of scholar athletes. And she really drops that into the context of, um, of African American history and, uh, particularly in the Jim Crow South. But, you know, it goes much deeper than that. She, when, when she speaks about this work and, and her other, other quilts, she really um, is able to connect with and connect the, vi the viewer to the individual aspects of each figure. And, and I think creates deeply humanizing work and really tries to emphasize that human connection. She uses just beautiful colors and hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces of cloth to make each piece. Um, and uh, and creates this incredible depth uh, with her use of textiles, which range from kente cloth to uh, lots of hand dyed cloth and uh, Dutch wax prints, both made in Africa and then those made in Europe for the African market. And all of them are you know literally layered with as many stories themselves as as the layers that she builds up uh, on on her quilt to make these make these figures. So we want to bring people essentially by showing that work um, with also uh, another another piece that we have. Um, but by showing that work uh, in a sense outside of a chronology, we're bringing people in. We want to try to bring the visitor into some questions about, you know, well, really, who is America and, and what is this country? Uh, and how can we tell, obviously, not that entire story through quilts, but how can we open up uh, some doors to some stories that perhaps haven't been as emphasized or haven't been uh, as celebrated or, or fully explored? Um, of course, we all know that like no museum collection or any collection of anything can represent all of American history and uh, be comprehensive in that way, and nor can any 
one collection actually comprehensively represent all of American quilts. So um, these are really avenues into into stories that uh, we hope will resonate with visitors. And um, and you and I actually just talked about the um, the double wedding ring, which is in in another section of the exhibition. But um, one of the questions that we've been asked is, you know, why this quilt show now? Why this quilt show and why now? Uh, the um, and and being able to show the beautiful double wedding ring um, that it was uh, is part of the uh, was part of the Pilgrim Roy collection and. Uh, the signature object for Quilts and Color, which was on view at the MFA in 2014, uh, was such a great launch to this project because after that exhibition, uh, we were able to acquire some really, really important pieces uh, from the 19th and through the 20th century um, because of all the attention that uh, Quilts and Color brought to uh, the MFA's collection of quilts. Yeah, both of these pieces. I'm, you know, as you're talking, I've I've got them pulled up on my laptop, and it's just incredible to me um, that to God in truth, the expressions on their it's it's almost like she has the same artistic quality as a painting with fabric. It, it's just phenomenal. Uh, well, that is a great observation because <laughs> I think he's constant. I think Lisa Butler, the artist, is constantly reminding people that. There is no paint <laughs> on any of these. They are uh, literally layers of, of cloth that she carefully builds up. And, you know, they're not all printed cotton, too. She uses netting and just different textures. Um, and so, really, it's, it's not to be missed. Um, they're, they are, they are, uh, they're beautiful in reproduction, but they really come alive when you, when you see them. Oh. Um, we had, I had the just total privilege of, uh, with Lauren Whitley, uh, being able to visit Lisa Butler in her studio and to see actually to God and truth, she, she had finished the figures and sewn them onto the background, but oh. she hadn't quilted it yet. And so just, just to have like that one little opportunity to see a piece like that in progress was, um, was just so generous of her, uh, as, as an artist. And it was, it was just a real, a real privilege to see that piece. Uh, see that piece grow. Absolutely. So she quilted it herself as well. Yes, yeah, she has a long arm quilter okay. in her in her studio, okay. and uh, wow. <clears throat> she you know makes the figures and then places them on the on the background in the case that polka dot cloth. And um, it's actually interesting that polka dot background cloth is um, it's a satin weave, but she uses the opposite side, so it's not oh, as shiny. Oh, okay. I know it's not like so it's like. It's just, um, and she was actually trained as a painter. She went to Howard University, and um, she told us a story that you know her professor at Howard said, "You know, you, you seem to be very interested in clothing and textiles. Like, why don't you take what you're doing in painting and <clears throat> try it out in, in with this different material?" And um, and so that just planted that seed for what has become, you know, I. Just amazing work in in textiles that we're, yes. <laughs> we could all send a thank you note to her professor <laughs> to her professor yes that's incredible uh, it, these yeah. are the fun details that are are so fun to learn uh, you know behind the exhibit so yeah yeah like what inspires these artists to do this and why and it's all so different you know every 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 quilt has its own story, but really every artist and every quilt maker, they have their own story. They have each have their own stories too about how they've how they've come to it. Right. This is fabulous. I should mention to um to my listeners too, they 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 kind of know Billy. He pops in and out every once in a while on the podcast, but he actually has a history degree. So I'm sure this is oh, interesting to him as well, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, actually very very much so. Even though I'm not I'm not a quilter, I'm not I don't have any of those skills, but I could I could listen to you tell the, the these stories all day. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, I don't. I don't. I'm not a quilter either, Billy. So we have. Oh wow. <laughs> but you had me fooled. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, then, actually, like really, the Harriet Powers quilt, which okay. is so much about history in a sense, um, because she in in the pictorial quilt, which is part of the MFA's collection, she combines stories from the New and the Old Testament with these stories from 
both before she was born and um, and during her lifetime that we assume were told through oral history. I mean, one of them, she's sitting in the center uh, uh, block with the navy with a dark blue background and the stars falling. That was from the Leonid uh, meteor shower in 1833. Oh. And uh, she was very specific in narrating what each scene was um, when it was um, at, you know, when it was given as a gift to um, one of the uh, for the chairman of the board to the chairman of the board of uh, Atlanta College in um, in the late 1890s. And um, so to me, like, I, I'm always amazed when I, when I read her account of each scene and look at each scene at how each one has, these, you know, incredible compositions of, of figures and the hand of God and the eye of God and nature and so much of the cosmos is contained in these quilts. And, and I should say quilts, I'm using the plural because we're so fortunate to have, we'll be able to borrow the Smithsonian Harriet Powers Bible quilt. These are the only two known extant examples of her work. Wow. Together, they will be shown together for the first time ever. They were never shown together in her lifetime. Wow, that's incredible. So it's truly a historic <laughs> moment. And so that's just so exciting to be able to have those together and uh, give people an opportunity to see that, as well as the MFA is fortunate to have um, it's almost sort of a legend, a handwritten legend, probably done uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the late 1890s when it was given as a gift to this person who was on the board of, the Atlant- of Atlanta College. Uh, also, the uh, very small photograph, portrait photograph, of her, which is reproduced many, many times, and um, so that will also be on view. So it's an incredible historical document. It's the only known image of Harriet Powers. Um, so it's a, it's just like we're really trying to make sure that um, people who have the opportunity to visit the exhibition will will really be able to to experience the, to experience something that is it's truly a once in a lifetime chance to do this. And I'm 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 just. Like, I'm so proud of the MFA. Oh, yes. <laughs> the, the, the museum is doing this. It's, it's just a, it's really wonderful. And, uh, and it's the product of, you know, years of thinking and, 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 uh, and it's just, it's, it's marvelous to think about this actually happening in a few months. Oh, absolutely. Soon. Now, actually, by the time this is, this is, this is <laughs> right, closed, it'll be now. <laughs> it will be there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that and then is... you know we have the beautiful Paul family quilt. Uh, it was uh, actually uh, acquired from uh, the a descendant of the maker, and uh, the, they live in Solon, Maine, a uh, small town up in Maine. And um, it's just a, just a marvelous wool quilt, which is you know appliqued and uh, embroidered. Really, I should say. Uh, Embroidered wool quilts were part of a New England quilting tradition, and I, you know, I, I, I have to say that this is just one of the most extraordinary examples of it, and it is a delightful quilt. We're having um, a special poem. We commissioned a, a poem from uh, a woman who grew up with quilt makers, and that'll be on the label. Um, it's just it's just a beautiful quilt with incredible piecing and uh, and it's just a beautiful design of circles and uh, and squares, but then with this terrific embroidery on it of uh, probably portraits of the family and uh, and terrific little riders on horses with flags and there are cats and there are owls and there are trees and flowers and so it will really be. Um, just, just a wonderful thing to have on view, and um, and so we're we're thrilled to show that, and that again shows that we have these beautiful 19th century quilts, like the Harriet Powers quilt and the Paul family quilt, but um, but we were able to acquire newer pieces for the publication and exhibition. Um, another piece that we acquired for for it was uh, the Richard Rowley Century of Progress quilt, which was part of the now I quite I think quite famous or infamous. Sears Quilt Contest uh, that was uh, held during the Century of Project Progress International Exhibition in Chicago in 1933 for the 1933 World's Fair, 
And um, in this quilt, it's always great to talk about because, you know, we want to make sure that we get men into the story. Right. <laughs> and uh, thanks to the terrific research of uh, Mary Kay, Mary Kay Walt- Baldwogel, who's an expert in the uh, in this in this uh, exhibition and in early 20th century quilts, she uh, she was able to find out from family members that he actually had made this quilt um, because when he entered it, he used his mother's name. She lived oh. in Chicago, and he lived in <laughs> Chicago. He was uh, an architectural draftsman, so he would have had access to the fair the designs for the fairground. And I hope people can come and see this quilt because um, it's so beautifully appliqued and with great detailed embroidery. And um, it has all the colors of the first um, iteration of the first, basically like the first paint job that all the buildings got. Oh, okay. um, and so they were really brightly colored. And it, it for me, it just has such resonance because, you know, I think of those 1930s black and white movies and black and white photographs. And it's a great reminder of just, how people really needed color during the depression. I mean, and, and how, how, how deeply, how saturated those colors actually were right. um, in that, in that time period. Yeah. This so, is just and, beautiful. It's just, it's just stunning. And it's so much like what an architectural draftsman would make uh-huh. <laughs> with the way right. they use the print, you know, the, the sort of foliage, fo- the, uh, the sort of little sort of floral vegetal prints for, the canopy of the trees, the landscape. <laughs> right. <laughs> just, just, just a marvelous, uh, you know, it, it's like, you know, it, it's art, but it's also just telling such, um, such a great story of the maker and the place and time uh, from which it, which it came. And uh, so I hope people, I hope people can come and see it. If not, as you said, the book has beautiful, has beautiful photographs. So you can, you can get up close, get up close with them too. Right. Yeah, it really does. It looks like an architectural model, like the dimensions. Uh, I mean, it looks like it's three dimensional, even just looking at yes. it. So, yes. And the way they quilted, or I assume it was Richard Crowley. I think his mother probably helped him. Um, but that is just uh, my my guess um, that they they did the waves of the water. You know, so these concentric quilting uh, quilted lines of circles. Um, right. You know, to look like water and a little boat. And it's just it's just a marvelous marvelous quilt and to have in the collection and to, sh- and to share with share with visitors oh yes it's fabulous and in that same gallery actually that will be in uh um a gallery that we're titling modern myths because those are mostly our 1930s quilts through the mid-60s uh we're also going to show one of our uh cheese bend quilts that uh we were able to acquire through the generosity of Souls Grown Deep Foundation, which is one of the sponsors of the show. Uh, it is a beautiful quilt made by Rachel Carey George in the early 1930s. And uh, if you look carefully, you can see in the white part of the cloth um, in between the housetop squares, um, a little printing. Okay. And that's from a cornmeal sack. So it's cornmeal sacking oh. mixed in, right, with that... Um, that housetop or log cabin pattern in those reds and the plaids and the, and the prints. And you know, those, those colored pieces of colored cloth, those would have come from clothing worn by her family and worn in the community. And, you know, to like, I think all great art comes from some sort of limitation or from economy. I think there's economy in all great art. And right. I think this is just a, just a perfect example of that, that she was able to use, that cornmeal sacking graphic in with that print, you know, in such in such a beautiful way um, that uh, it's just I find it a very inspiring piece that also is a great counterpoint to you know the optimistic name of the Chicago World's Fair being the century of progress and it, you know really puts puts that event uh, in in context. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very special piece to share with others. Oh, yeah. This is just incredible. So um, as you go from room to room, are they, cro- are they separated by time period then? Because I know you said it wasn't chronological, but 
uh, essentially is chronological. Okay. We start off and it, it, there, it, it, the first gallery is not chronological. Okay. It's with, with Lisa Butler Quilt. And, um, but then we go into a chronology. So then the okay. second gallery, which uh, is titled Unseen Hands, is, uh, shows our late 17th uh, through the 18th century examples, or examples that are dated from the late 17th century through the 18th century. Okay. And then uh, after that gallery, we have um, essentially our first half of the 19th century quilts, and that's in a gallery titled The Price of Progress, where we explore these quilts in the context of um, the expanding boundaries of the uh, of the country, and then also the expansion, essentially like the industrial scale scale of slavery, which was important for producing cotton, which of course the very cotton that's exported to mills in Manchester is what makes up some of the quilts, makes up some of the, the quilt tops that you can actually visibly see. Um, and then from there we go into um, a gallery that we titled uh, Conflict Without Resolution that introduces the Civil War, um, both its sort of legacy, how people, you know, one quilt uh, looks back on a time before the Civil War. It was made after the Civil War. One was made actually during the Civil War. I'm pretty sure. And um, and then and then the legacy of of, of slavery in the Jim Crow South. Um, and the uh, and even up to today with the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, and then there's a moment because that gallery really deals with some very tough narratives and content and imagery there's a moment of sort of repose in that gallery where there's a space where people can sit and just reflect they can write in a comment book they can um, look at other books and um, and just have a moment of pause um, you know there are there are um, quilts are such beautiful objects and you know they are uh, this exhibition once you know, we want to celebrate how beautiful these works of art are and how they've been appreciated by generations and generations of people and how they've, you know, continue to be made and, um, and, and have inspired um, so much in our culture and reflect so much of our culture. But there are definitely some, some tough, uh, uh, difficult narratives, too. In it. Right. And um, so it's just kind of a nice moment to just pause. And also... You know, it's just also a nice spot in the middle of the exhibition where, you know, if people want to sit, they can. And um, and then also, it's also just before the Harriet Powers, where we'll have the gallery where, where the two Harriet Powers quotes will be, too. So um, we're anticipating that a lot of people are coming just, you know, specifically to see those two quilts. So the gallery after that is titled Quilts as Art, where we explore how quilts become essentially like a popular art form. You know, they move from the bed to the wall and they're right. shown in world fairs and fairs. And so the Harriet Powers quilts um, are a perfect illustration of that. I mean, there's certainly neither of them were designed or made to be used on a bed. She was designing, she made them, you know, to be shown. Right. And um, so, uh, and then from that, so we are sort of still moving through a chronology and then from there we move into what is essentially sort of the, um, you could call it sort of the third quarter of the 19th century gallery modern myths where we look at quilts in the 30s and 40s and 50s, um, but how they uh, fed into and, and rec in a sense like recreated this myth of, of the American quilt. And, you know, of course, we all know that quilts are made all over the world and have been made all over the world for, um, for thousands of years. Um, but, you know, there is something that sort of happens in, the 19th century where quilts become something that is uh, a really important art form in the, in the American context and for Americans. And, um, and so the nice thing about that gallery space where we'll have um, the Rachel Carey George housetop quilt and the Richard Rowley is um, we'll also have the Amish bars quilt where we can talk about and introduce the idea of quilts not not uh, not only moving onto the wall, but also moving into the walls of art museums, you know, so right. that, and that was such a, you know, if you talk, as you know, if you talk to people about quilts who love quilts, you know, they always talk about the Jonathan Holstein exhibition at the Whitney in 1971, how it was this watershed moment 
And, um, you know, in a sense, like Amish quilts were really at the tip of that spear. And, um, and so to have quilts recognized, to have American quilts recognized as, you know, worthy of the American art canon, such that it is, or such that it's conceived, um, right. was something that really happened in large part because of these abstract geometric quilts of which Amish quilts were sort of always uh, perceived as being sort of the most important. And, um, and so from that, from that sort of <clears throat> mythical myth, myth making, uh, we move into the last gallery, which uh, we've titled um, uh, Making a Difference. And <clears throat> it's interesting because I always, we always think of this as like the contemporary gallery, but you know, it really, it covers, we, we include examples that were made in 1975 all the way to today. And um, that's actually a very long period of time. It's actually right. sort of a longer span. Than, <laughs> it's sort of like going back, and not quite as long as the late 17th through the 18th century. But in a sense, we sort of are going back to a broader, um, a broader scope. Um, and, uh, you know, it includes the work of artists working in the 70s and 80s as uh, while they might not be political in content, they were certainly uh, challenging the hierarchy of media in the art world, and they had important <clears throat> they had important stories to tell themselves or important messages um, to convey. Uh, all the way to the today, um, we've also included um, some works of art that are not quilts, actually, but look like quilts, where artists working either with 16 millimeter film material and light. Or, um, or three-dimensional, uh, uh, three-dimensional materials of paper and wood, uh, have been inspired by, uh, the power of American quilt making and, uh, the patterns associated with them, uh, to tell, to tell stories about, um, for example, the exploitation of the labor of women and children in the tech by the te very textile industry <laughs> right <laughs> that um you know the uh um which is so such a big part of the history of particularly new england and but the whole country really and a, and a global story as well and uh, and then all the way to to the 21st century uh we're including several works by uh contemporary quilt artists artists working in quilts including carla hemlock who is uh, Haudenosaunee or Iroquois artist um, who lives uh, in Ganawage, just south of Montreal. Okay. And many know her really primarily for her beadwork, but she's also an amazing quilt maker. And uh, we acquired for the collection a quilt that she titles uh, Survivors. Um, it includes um, the in beaded, in beaded letters, the names of over 40 uh, Native American and First Nations communities that survive today, despite essentially the attempt to, um, essentially the genocidal policies of white settler culture. And those are, in a sense, I'm paraphrasing her. Um, but she uses the star pattern. It's actually, it's interesting. It's like, how could you have a show and not have a star pattern quilt, you know? This right. Is like a beautiful <laughs> pattern. And so it's actually our only example of a star pattern quilt. And it's, and it's it's gorgeous, and she wanted to use that, what she calls a settler pattern or a, a European white pattern, um, uh, a pattern based on white culture or European culture. Um, but she sort of, she, what she does is she alters it and surrounds it and takes, you know, essentially the points off um, with these appliqued um, figures from uh, wampum belts that were, are very, remain a very important storytelling um, vehicle or object uh, for, for the Mohawk and other Native American communities. And, um, and then outside of that ring is uh, in, in, um, in uh, also wampum figures in beadwork are actually the names of all of the different tribes that, um, that she's honoring in this quilt. So, um, so that's just one example of how, um, how, Quilt, quilt makers and artists today um, are, uh, you know, really using quilts to bring people in. I mean, she deliberately makes quilts and chooses these patterns that uh, will pull people into stories that they might not necessarily be as open to, you know, um, if they read an article or saw another type of art. I mean, they're very deliberately using that 
uh, feeling of <clears throat> intimacy and closeness and warmth that textiles in particular can convey. Um, and just also the beauty of the patterning of quilts and um, the stitching and all of this, uh, you know, as, a, as an art form, it, it has so much that, uh, that brings people in and makes people feel comfortable. And then, um, you know, actually having content that is as challenging as content found in other places, uh, in art museums and other types of uh, media. Yeah, this uh, this quilt, this star just draws you in at the center, and it is so traditional. And and then I thought that the names were embroidered, but they're all beaded. Um, that, that it must yes, just it's all be all appliqued in red red beads. Oh, and wow. her beadwork is also just beautiful. And um, it it is really a spectacular piece that has so much power that I think. Um, Again, I think when when you see it, um, but it also is beautifully illustrated in the publication too. So, uh-huh. I was just wondering, do the eight squares, you know, four set on point and four set regular, do they represent anything, or do you think they're just uh, part of her really... design? I they're because they're just they're blank, uh, unless there's yeah. just yeah, I don't know. Well, she did hand quilt it herself. Okay. So she never went into that much detail with me about if those had symbolic meanings. They very well may have uh-huh. symbolic meaning for her. Um, I would say just as um, a sort of a witness to this, to, to the beauty of, of this work of art that they show her incredible hand quilting stitches, hand quilted stitches and, um, and as you know, I mean, so much of seeing the quilt is experiencing that right. that three dimensional sculptural feeling. So, um, or or sculptural um, uh, 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 quality. That um, so I don't know. I don't know if it was again. It's like you always sort of. It's, it's like the unanswerable question. It's a great question because there's no answer. It's like, right. is it about message? Is it about content? Is it about story? Or is it about artistry? Is it about the way it looks? And and that's what's so great about art in in creating empathy and bringing people into story is that it is it can be disarming and it can pull people in because it is very individual to the um, to the maker. Right. And the artist. Right. Yeah, this this has just been so fabulous. I have just felt like uh, I've I've learned so much just from our conversation. Just and just wanna <laughs> keep looking at these quilts. They are so incredible. Well you've asked such, you know, you asked such great questions that uh, it's a pleasure to think about um, think about these works of art through your perception and what you're seeing and asking about. So it's, it's really just a, it's a pleasure for me um, to be able to talk about you know, the publication and the exhibition that so many have worked so hard on um, that. Uh, yeah, it's really, really, um, it's really, it's just been, it's just been a marvelous, it's been an incredible journey. And I'm so glad that, you know, we didn't just say, okay, we're going to, not, we're going to draw a line in 1950 or we're going to draw a line at 1980 or 19, like, or, you know, no 21st century quilts because so much would have been missing from that story that I think is these works of art that are older really, uh, uh, it's almost like providing an optimistic context to remind people that, you know, this is a really vibrant art form that's from our past, but is also moving us into the future. Absolutely. Yeah. And I have to just say, you know, at the beginning of the recording, I I believe you mentioned, you know, we're looking to attract quilters and and non-quilters. And just to be 100% honest with you, my first thought was, I don't know if I I would go to a quilt exhibit unless I was into quilting. But, you know, after the conversation, after everything, you know, listening to you speak about these, you've switched me, you've changed my mind. I, you know, the history behind it and the details. So even as American history lovers or quilt lovers, I think you could find a lot from this exhibit. Well, thank you, Bill, for being a convert. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's very interesting. Story. 
Well, it is, you know, we have, a, we are, I would say the MFA is very fortunate to have truly an amazing collection of uh, of art, all of the art here is, is I mean, we're, we're so fortunate to have such an amazing collection that so many have contributed to for over a century, over you know, now just over 150 years. And um, so to have a chance to share that is, is, is just amazing. And um, there really, you know, there really is a lot going on um, in the art world related to quilts right now. And um, particularly as as we move forward, I mean, uh, or just as we sit today and look at the crisis that the whole world has gone through, and um, you know the, uh, the 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 difficult and um, challenging parts of this American experiment that we're going through, and and having a reckoning with racial inequity and um, we're we're very fortunate to um, we're very fortunate to have be able to ha have this exhibition to provide people with an opportunity to come together with art to celebrate this art form yes absolutely and I I, I think you're right it as I think more and more will will show of of people turning to art during difficult times such as we've had recently. And I, I know in the quilting world that there are stories of women who they just made quilts in huge numbers. Uh, and, but, and then other, you know, for mostly utilitarian purposes, but also those women who turn to quilting as an art form. And this, this is yeah, just a yeah. wonderful and, example. And I'm so glad that you, you, you said that because, that is such a, a part of what people have experienced. Um, and we wanted to make sure that the visitor uh, to the exhibition and also, you know, looking at, at the book too, that we recognized, um, we recognized that to some, to the extent that we were able to, because as you know, like when you plan publications or exhibitions are often, uh, it takes a while to get them actually on display or in, in publication. So, um, uh, so we wanted to be, I wouldn't say current isn't really the right word, but resonant and acknowledge uh, the challenges that people have gone through. Right. Wow. Well, is, is there anything else you want to share? With, this has just been fabulous. I just can't even wait to have this air because I think people are just going to absolutely love listening to this episode. But uh, oh, is there anything else you... you would like to no, share? No, I think that's okay. it, Sherry. It's always okay. nice to meet you, and thank you. I think you should be applauded for helping your mother. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't do any of this tech stuff without him, so he, he does all the video and all the sound, and <laughs> very, very helpful. <laughs> well, as it takes many hands uh, to lift a quilt, to launch a quilt show, I'm sure it takes many hands to launch a quilt podcast, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Marvelous. Well, All right. Well, it was wonderful to talk to both of you. Yes, thank you. We have just really enjoyed this time and really appreciate you reaching out. And and oh, we're, we just feel really blessed to have this. Well, it, it's just been wonderful for me too. And I hope I'll have a chance to meet you both here in Boston during the exhibition or some other time. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I hope that you enjoyed this conversation today. As I mentioned before, I it was just a, a fabulous experience for me to get to have that discussion with Jennifer about these quilts. And we will put links and all the information you need to know about the exhibit, as well as link to that book that we mentioned. And if you're in the area, I, I just would highly recommend uh, making a little day trip to, I, I believe... You have to make a reservation to attend. I believe that Jennifer and I talked about that in our conversation. Uh, so we'll have, we'll have all that information in the description. Also, we just want to let you know that we'll be back with our next episode on Monday, November 8th. We'll see you then. Thanks so much for stopping by. <laughs>